in today's lecture, I'd like to talk about some of the basic ideas behind bosons and fermions, and also about classical versus quantum statistics. So in order to understand bosons and fermions, uh, you need to remember the concept of spin. So spin is the intrinsic angular momentum, um, which of course also leads to the intrinsic magnetic moment of a particle. Lots of times we think of having an angular momentum because something's in an orbit and so it's moving around an origin, or because something's spinning on its axis. And of course you can conceptualize the idea of a particle spinning on its axis as giving it spin, but that's not really the reality, especially since electrons, for example, are point particles in and of themselves. So what does it really mean for a point particle to spin on its axis? No. Okay, so really it's just an intrinsic angular momentum which leads to an intrinsic magnetic moment. So particles can have an intrinsic mass and they can have an intrinsic angular momentum, okay? All right, so we've already discussed the spin of an electron um, in previous lectures. And so uh, the total spin angular momentum, uh, spin angular momentum is usually symbolized by S. So the magnitude of the total spin angular momentum for uh, an electron, an isolated electron, is h bar times the square root of lowercase s times s plus 1. Now for an electron, s, the quantum number, spin quantum number, is 1 half, and then the magnetic spin quantum number is plus or minus 1 half. And this is how we usually refer to a spin up or a spin down particle. For spin up particles, it's plus 1 half, the magnetic quantum number, and for uh, down particles, it's minus 1 half, okay? So the electron is just one of many fermions. Other familiar half-integer spin particles include protons and neutrons, okay? Now, fermions, all fermions, obey the Pauli exclusion principle, and their statistics are special, and the distribution function that describes them is the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. So what's the exclusion principle? Well, the exclusion principle was uh, originally developed by Wolfgang Pauli to explain, uh, help explain the structure um, and chemical nature of electrons in atoms, and it explained the periodic table, basically, and why certain columns had certain chemical properties. All right. What it says is that no two electrons that are in the same atom can be in the same quantum state. So each electron within the same atom has to have a different set of spin or of quantum numbers. Okay. So, for example, if you have uh, helium, all right, you have two electrons in helium, and one is in n equal to 1, l equal to 0, ml equal to 0, and then one of them will be spin up, and then one of them will be spin down, so that they have different sets of quantum numbers. Now, if the exclusion principle weren't valid, what would happen is those electrons would radiate energy away until every single electron was in that 1s state for every atom, and that would greatly change the chemical nature of the elements. Now, it turned out that this exclusion principle, which was um, came up with to describe atoms, is also generally valid. So, fermions that occupy the same potential well obey the exclusion principle, and no two fermions in the same potential well will have the same exact same set of quantum numbers. All right, so that's a summary of fermions. What are bosons? Well, fermions are half integer spin particles, right? Bosons are particles that have integer spin. Now, this can be because they are composite particles made up of a bunch of fermions. So, for example, helium-4 has two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus, and if you do the sum of the angular momentum for it, it's an integer spin particle, okay? Because you can add up half integer spins and get an integer spin. So, helium-4 is a composite boson, even though it's composed of fermions. Now, you can also have particles that, by themselves, have integer spin. For example, pions, those have integer spin. Another um, example of a boson is a photon or a particle of light. So it usually surprises students to learn that even though photons don't have mass, that they can have momentum, right? 
And they have momentum because they have this intrinsic energy described by Planck's constant times their frequency, hf. And then the energy and the momentum are related to one another via, per photons, E is equal to pc. So that means that the momentum is equal to the energy of the photon divided by c, right? So particles can have momentum. Photons can have momentum. They can also have angular momentum. Now, the way that I like to wrap my head around this is I think about the polarization of the photon. So remember that the polarization of light is basically how the electric field vector, right? Photons are oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So how that electric field vector is inclined with respect to an axis is its polarization. So uh, integer spin, there's really two choices. It can be right circularly polarized or left circular, circularly polarized. So that means that the electric field vector oscillates in a way that is either counterclockwise rotation or clockwise rotation, and that gives it its angular momentum. So that's how I wrap my head around that idea. Even though it doesn't have any mass, it can still have an angular momentum to it. And this angular momentum leads to the selection rules for transitions that can be made within atoms, for example. So if an electron hops up or down in its energy levels, then <clears throat> when it does that hop, those hops have to satisfy conservation laws. It has to conserve energy, and it also has to conserve angular momentum. Now, all of the carrier or exchange particles, not just the photon, so for all the four fundamental forces of nature, <clears throat> all the exchange or carrier particles um, have integer spin. So photons are the carrier particle for the electromagnetic force. They have integer spin. Gluons are the carrier particle for the strong force. <clears throat> they have integer spin. And then the W and Z bosons, the carrier particles for the weak force, they also have spin 1. And then finally gravity, the graviton, that's a spin 2 boson. All right, so all integer spins. Now that we've talked about fermions and bosons, let's talk a little bit about classical versus quantum statistics and why these rules for fermions or bosons can lead to such different statistics. So let's remember back, since we've uh, already kind of covered classical statistics via the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, so let's think back about ideal gases and some of our fundamental assumptions about them. And then we'll talk about how those fundamental assumptions are violated for the various types of statistics. So the first one, there's no theoretical limit on the number of particles with a given energy. So for example, in a classical um, scenario, there's no reason that all of the ideal gas molecules can't be going the same speed, right? Now it doesn't happen, of course, they obey their distribution function. But there's no real theoretical reason why it couldn't happen. And the second assumption is that the particle size is small compared to the separation between the particles. And that's because in order to be an ideal gas, you have to assume that the density of that gas is low. So now let's talk about those two assumptions and their implications. Let's talk about number one first, the theoretical limit on the number of particles within a given energy. Classical particles can all occupy the same energy state, and there's no restriction on that. Now, bosons are not subject to the Pauli exclusion principle, so they can do that too. They can all, all occupy the same energy state with no problems. But fermions, not so much. They obey the exclusion principle, and that's going to change your statistics and how those, um, uh, the distribution of the number of particles that you have over the available energy states, which is basically what distribution functions do. So let's talk about an example where we have eight particles and they have a total combined energy of 8E, okay? So if you think of the energy E as the energy of one excited state, so you're going up in one energy level, right? Now, let's look at bosons and also maybe classical particles and talk about how they would fit into this scenario. So if you've got a total energy of 8E and you have eight particles, then seven of them, could be in the ground state with nothing, and one of them could be in an excited state of 8E. And if you wanted to do that, there'd be eight ways that you could make that happen because there's eight different choices of particles, right? There's no restriction there. They can all sit in that ground state together because there's no restriction on the number of particles that can occupy a given state. Another way to do it um, would be to have um, seven, six particles. Sorry, this is a typo here six particles in the ground state, 
one particle in the first excited state and then one particle in 70, right? And there's 56 ways you could do that. Likewise, you could have um, six particles in the ground state, one particle in the uh, 2E energy state, and one particle in the 6E energy state, and there's 56 ways to do that. You could put four particles in the ground state and four particles in the 2E excited state. There'd be 70 ways to do that. This isn't even a full list of all the possibilities, but you can see that those are your statistics, okay? Now let's think about how a fermion would do it, right? So let's say that for each available energy state, because they have to obey the exclusion principle, you can put one spin up and one spin down particle in each energy state. So you'd have one spin up and one spin down in zero, the ground state, one spin up and one spin down in the 1E energy state, one spin up and one spin down in the 2E energy state, and one spin up and one spin down in the 3E energy state. That's six plus four is 10, and then 12E. So the total energy is 12E. We can't even have fermions have 8E of energy. Okay, it's not even possible. That's too low of an energy for them, all right? Now, if you put one of them in the first excited state, well, then it would look like this, right? and one of them would move up and the total energy would be 13E. So you can see right away that this is gonna have a very dramatic effect on how particles are distributed and how many can have each given energy. That's greatly going to affect the statistics. Okay, so let's now talk about point two. The particle size is small compared with the separation between the particles. Now this was an assumption about the density, okay? All right, so let's discuss that. We've already talked about ideal gas statistics. Specifically, we developed the partition function, right, for an ideal gas. So the partition function for an ideal gas said that V times the partition function for any rotational or internal energy states, Z internal, V times Z internal, divided by the number of particles, N, divided by the quantum volume V sub Q raised to the N power, right, times E to the N. That's our partition function. Now our quantum volume was Planck's constant H divided by the square root of 2 pi M K T, where M is the mass of the particle, uh, K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the temperature. And then you cube that for the quantum volume. So the deal is that if the volume occupied per particle is actually much larger than the quantum volume, then what will happen is, if you, if you picture a quantum particle as having a, a particular wave function, wavelength, right? Then if you've got them well separated, their wavelengths for their wave functions don't overlap. Now, if their wave functions did overlap, that would change their probabilities of location. But if they're well separated, the wave functions don't overlap, and you can treat them classically. In other words, you can ignore that quantum nature, that wavelength, because it doesn't really play in much to the, to the particle. Okay? So, let's talk about this. Let's run the numbers for an ideal gas. So let's say that you've got an ideal gas like nitrogen N2, and it's at room temperature and one atmosphere. All right? So the mass of nitrogen is 28 atomic mass units, because there's two nitrogens, of course, in every molecule. And the temperature, ideal gas, room temperature, let's just say 300 Kelvin, okay? So if you plug in those numbers into your quantum volume equation, it would be H over, H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. And then we're dividing by the square root of 2 pi. The mass is 28U. You'd have to convert the atomic mass units, one atomic mass unit of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. K, Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, and then T is 300, right? So if I plug all that into my calculator and run the numbers, then I end up with a quantum volume of 6.9 times 10 to the minus 33 cubic meters. Now, let's use the ideal gas equation and solve for V over N. So V over N would be equal to KT over P, because PV is equal to NKT for an ideal gas, right? So we can solve V over N is equal to KT over P. If I plug in Boltzmann's constant times the temperature 300 Kelvin divided by one atmosphere, which is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals, 
then I end up with a value of V over N of 4.1 times 10 to the minus 26 cubic meters. All right. Now, that's seven orders of magnitude, roughly, larger than my quantum volume. So that means that it's occupying this uh, region of space that's much, much larger than the volume that its wave function would occupy. So it's, in effect, isolated, right? And its quantum nature doesn't really play much. Now let's think about a different one. Okay, let's think about a neutron star. So neutron stars um, have densities of about 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter, right? Of course, it might vary depending on the neutron star, but this is just order of magnitude back of the envelope calculation, right? Now, a few years after they're formed, um, the temperatures of isolated neutron stars are roughly 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So let's use that as an estimate for the temperature. Now, if it really is neutrons, and they've achieved this degeneracy, then each particle has a mass of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay, so this is a solid. So the density is equal to the mass divided by volume. Solving, the volume would be equal to the mass divided by the density. So the mass of a neutron is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and then we divide that by its density, 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. Solving, we get a volume for one neutron of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 44 cubic meters. All right. Now, let's use that same calculation for the quantum volume that we did before, h over the square root of 2 pi mkt, except now I'm plugging in a mass of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 and a temperature of, 300, uh, a temperature of 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So running those numbers, I get a quantum volume of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 12 cubic meters, right? The temperature is a lot higher, so that changes your quantum volume. So is V over N much, much greater than your quantum volume? Absolutely not. No, it's not satisfying that at all. So what that means is that the wave functions for those neutrons packed in so tightly overlap significantly, and so their quantum nature is now strongly in play, right? So, the result of all this, if the volume per particle is comparable to or smaller than the quantum volume, then quantum statistical distributions will describe the conditions instead of classical distributions. So there's two quantum distributions that we'll cover. The Fermi-Dirac, which describes Fermi fermions, and the Bose-Einstein, which describes bosons. And then here is a little sketch on the right-hand side of uh, what those basic distribution functions look like. So you can see that the Bose-Einstein and the Maxwell-Boltzmann, they look kind of similar, except the uh, Bose-Einstein has a floor, right, a limit um, that they approach, right? And the uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann's is lower, right? And then the Fermi-Dirac, it's completely different for low values of the energy, epsilon minus mu over kt. Now you can see that as they approach uh, large values, they overlap significantly, right? So as they go to the right there, they tend to overlap. And that makes sense, because for any quantum system, as you increase your energy level, then uh, they get more and more continuous looking. And so your quantum system starts to look more classical. All right? Well, I'm going to stop there for now. We'll cover more details about bosons and fermions in further lectures, and I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in class.